right, so today we're going into part 11, part 11 on the search for the doctrine of grace, and we're continuing where we left off in 2 Corinthians. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to read 15 verses here, the entire chapter, because we have the word grace or the word charis, the word that we've been studying, coming up in verses 8, 14, and 15. But again, for context, we're going to start in verse 1. Indeed, concerning the service to the set-apart ones, it is unnecessary for me to write to you, for I know your eagerness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia has, uh, was ready a year ago, and your ardor was stirred up most of them, has stirred up most of them. But I sent the brothers, lest our boasting on behalf of you should be made empty in this part, in order that, as I said, you were ready. Lest if the Macedonians come with me and find you not ready, we, not to speak of you, should be put to shame because of our, should be put to shame because of our belief. Now notice what he's talking about here. He's saying, look, he's talking about boasting about what? About being ready. Which means what? They did something. You see, again, I want to see, I want you to see also in here that there's always an implied, if not direct, reference to people doing things that's going to then be connected to this favor. So here he's talking about boasting about people being ready for their coming. And we get to a verse um, 5, and it says, So I thought it necessary to appeal to the brothers to come to you in advance and arrange your promised blessing beforehand, this to be ready as a blessing and not as greediness. And this, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows a blessing shall also reap on blessing. So now we're talking about basically he was coming to accept an offering that they were supposed to have, available and ready. And then he says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not of grief or of necessity, for Elohim loves a joyous giver. And now we get to verse 8, our first appearance of the word. He says, and Elohim is able to make all favor overflow towards you, that you, always having all you need in every way, have plenty for every good work. So he's saying that Elohim is able to bless you, have favor shown upon you. Sometimes it just means favor. And he says, but look, it's merited. He's saying Elohim is able to give you this merited favor if you're a joyful giver. If you're going to give as, as, as you have been given. If you're going to sow sparingly, well, you're going to reap sparingly. If you're going to sow blessing, you're going to also reap on blessing. And so here we have the word favor coming right after the discussion of a work or an action that would be done that would either bring approval in Elohim's eyes or not bring approval in Elohim's eyes. So I think we can see again that the word grace here, the word favor, is merited. And it says here that Elohim is able to make all favor, all approval, to be done towards you and overflow towards you, because when he approves of you, what does he do? He pours blessings upon you. So when you're in approval, you have blessings. And that's what we read in Deuteronomy 28, in the blessings and the cursings chapter. If you diligently obey, this brings approval, and approval brings blessing. And then later on it says, but if you do not obey, then you're going to reap the cursings because you're not in good standing. You're not in the place called approval. So you've not merited the favor. So let's continue. He says, verse 9, as it has been written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Amen. And he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and increase the seed you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. Amen being enriched in every way for all simplicity, which works out thanksgiving to Elohim through us. So now he's talking again about this work of supplying needs, of generosity, of sowing seed. And then we get to verse 12 and he says, because the rendering of this service, see this is a service, it's a work, it's a service, not only supplies the needs of the set-apart ones, but also is overflowing through many thanksgivings to Elohim. Through the poor, excuse me, through the proof of this service, they esteem Elohim on the submission of your confession to the good news of Messiah and generosity and sharing with them all and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding favor of Elohim in you. See, their prayer for you, who long for you because of what? Because of the approval of Elohim that's in you. Because of the being in good standing with Elohim that is within you. He says, thanks also to Elohim for his unspeakable gift. And the word thanks there is also the same word that's translated grace. So he says, thanks 
also to Elohim. So sometimes the word there is translated simply thanks. And so he says, in which case, by the way, that's our approval. We appreciate, we approve. He's in good standing in our eyes. Not that he needs to be. And so thanks or approval to Elohim for his unspeakable gift. We appreciate what he's done for us. It puts him in very good standing with us. Hopefully that makes some sense as we go now to chapter 12. So as we're going through this, it should be very clear that the consistency has not broken down, not even once, of the favor being talked about, the grace that is merited favor being talked about is merited favor. Let's continue in chapter 12 and verse 1. Now we're going to read 10 verses here, but really we're focusing on eventually verse 9, which has the word favor in it. But let's go first to verse 1. To boast, indeed, is useless for me, for I shall go on to the visions and revelations of Yahweh. I know a man in Messiah who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, Elohim knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, Elohim knows, that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not right for a man to speak. Of such a one I shall boast, but of myself I shall not boast, except in my weakness. For if I shall wish to boast, I shall not be fool, for I shall speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think more of me than what he sees in me or hears of me. And to keep me from exalting myself because of the exceeding greatness of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to hit me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the master three times to take it away from me. Now, before we continue, let's understand what's going on here. And it's not about this whole, whether in the body or out of the body, that's a whole nother discussion. But what he's trying to say is, I know someone I can boast of who's not boasting of himself who gave me a testimony of something that he experienced, and I can boast of that, but what I'm not going to do is boast of myself. He's trying to explain how this all works in terms of the working of what he does. This other person was doing a work in Messiah 14 years ago, and he said, this man didn't boast, but I'm going to boast of him. So here he's now saying, but I'm not going to boast of myself, and to keep me from what? Pride, ego, vanity, Abba has given me a thorn, and he says, concerning this thorn, I pleaded three times. And now we're going to get to verse 9 to understand what's going on here. And he said to me, my favor, my approval is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, then, I shall rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Messiah rests on me. So what he's saying is, in order for me to do the works I'm called to do, to do the works he's called to do, Abba has seen fit to give him a thorn to keep him humble so that he would not become useless in the work. Because if it started to become about him, then he would be of no use anymore. And so he has this thorn. But notice that in verse 9, it's, it, it think it's the best translation. It would be say, my approval is sufficient for you. In other words, you don't need other people's approval. The fact that you merit approval in my eyes should be sufficient for you. You don't need anybody else's approval. Again, we're not talking about unmerited favor here. Because it would not fit in here. He wouldn't, you know, how does that fit? He said, he said to me, well, my, my unmerited favor is sufficient for you. The whole talk here is about whether or not approval from other people should be sought after. And he's saying, no, my approval is all you need. And he says, well, then I'd rather be boasting in my weaknesses so that I'm in approval with him and so that I can have that power of Messiah that rests upon me. So hopefully that makes that very clear that, again, this is a case of very clearly him talking about the approval that comes from meriting. He merited that approval because of the things that he did, but not the approval from men, but the approval from the Almighty himself. And then we get to verse 10 where he says, Therefore I take pleasure in weaknesses, in, result, excuse me, in insults, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for the sake of Messiah, for when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, be careful you think you stand lest you fall. He says, if I start to think I'm somebody, then I become nobody. Because then he will take this from me, and I will have no ability to share. I will have no insight, I will have no revelation, I will have no testimony. He says, so I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm going to say, 
I'm glad that he's keeping me weak so that I stay humble. Because if I start seeking approval and thinking I'm somebody great and I'm some, hey, I, I'm, I'm it, I'm the best, I'm, I'm the great one right here, then that will all disappear. Because we have other verses where Messiah says, look, you know, put, um, treasure up for yourself the treasures in heaven. You know, store up your, your treasures in heaven. He says, because if you're seeking your treasures here, then you've already received your treasure. And Messiah told us exactly that same concept. If you're seeking after approval here and treasures here and accolades here, well, then there isn't anything more to get. When you get to Judgment Day, I was just going to look you in the eye and say, well, you've already gotten your reward. But if you're going to treasure up and seek after the reward that you're storing up in heaven, he says, well, then you're going to be receiving that gift at that time. That's the thing you want to be storing up for. So Paul's talking about exactly the same thing here. So again, I hopefully have made it clear again, there's no doubt we're talking merited approval, a merited favor. Now let's go to chapter 13, 2 Corinthians 13, and in verse 11, the verse we're going to focus on is the last verse of the book of 2 Corinthians, verse 14, but we'll begin in verse 11. He says, for the rest, brothers, rejoice, be made perfect, be encouraged, be of one mind, live in peace, and the Elohim of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a set-apart set kiss, with a holy kiss. All the set-apart ones greet you. The favor of the Master Yeshua Messiah and the love of Elohim and the fellowship of the set-apart spirit be with all of you. Amen. Now, the reason I went back to verse 11 is I wanted you to hear these other things that would merit the favor. He's saying, look, be made perfect. Again, I think that word again would be more like the Hebrew tamim. Be filled with integrity. Be encouraged. Be of one mind. These are things that will eventually merit living in peace and the love of Elohim and his peace be, will be with you. You will merit these things if you are filled with integrity and encouragement of one mind and striving to live in peace. And so then he's saying, look, the approval of the Master Yeshua Messiah and the love of Elohim and the fellowship of the set-apart spirit be with you. So again, I can't see a way to justify this being unmerited because it's not in any context here that makes any sense. So again, we see that this is approval for what you're doing, approval for your actions, your thought process, your, your, um, your goals and your efforts to be perfect, your goals to be encouraged, to be of one mind, to, to live in peace. And I could say that in some ways, all of the Torah is based on trying to make those things happen. The Torah is going to be about loving the Almighty and loving your neighbor, which again has to do with encouragement, being of one mind, living in peace, and having integrity. So it all wraps up together. Because, let's face it, if you are not walking the commandments, you're either going to be breaking the commandments that have to do with how you treat your Creator, in which case you will be at enmity with Him, you will not be at peace with Him, or you will not be treating your neighbor correctly, and then you will not be at peace with your neighbor. And so you see the law, the Torah, all is wrapped up into these just a couple of verses here we just read. Now let's go to Galatians. Galatians, and we'll begin in chapter 1. Now, I want to make a couple of points here before we go into Galatians. Galatians and some of the other things you may read in Ephesians and etc., some of this stuff is going to be challenging and require a lot of explanation, which we're not going to do today. In other words, I want to make sure that we're not going to get distracted by some of the things that will be in some of the verses that have not that are not part of the issue about understanding what favor is and grace is. That is for another time. Otherwise, this will turn from another two or three teachings to get finished with to another 12 or 15 teachings to get finished with because we'll have to do something separate just to deal with Galatians as a book itself. Because there's a lot of things going on in there that need to be addressed, but not for today. So let's understand that I may skip over some things that are in the reading but I'm not going to go into too much detail because we just don't have the time for it in this thing. So hopefully that makes sense and is fair for everyone. Okay, so having said that, there's two verses in chapter 1. Actually, there's three verses in chapter 1. Verse 3, verse 6, and verse 15. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6 first in the book of Galatians. Shaul, an emissary, not from men, nor by a man, but by Yeshua Messiah and Elohim, the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the assemblies in Galatia. 
favor to you or, or, or peace, excuse me, excuse me, favor to you and peace from Elohim the Father and our Master Yeshua Messiah, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us out of his, this present wicked age according to the desire of our Elohim and Father. To whom be the praise forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so readily turning away from him who called you in the favor of Messiah to a different good news. Okay, so look at what's going on here. First of all, it's your typical greeting that you find in many of the letters of the apostles where he says, favor or grace be to you and peace from Elohim the Father and our Master Yeshua. So what is he wishing upon them? I'm wishing upon you undeserved, unmerited favor. That doesn't make any sense. He's saying, I wish favor and other approval. I'm praying and wishing that you have favor and approval in the eyes of Messiah and the Father. Well, that makes complete sense. And then we see, as we go further, he says, I marvel that you are so readily turning away from him who called you in the favor of Messiah to a different good news. So he's saying, I marvel that you would turn away. So how would, how would you turn away? You would turn away by your actions, which would be based on your beliefs. In order for you to turn away, your beliefs will have to have changed, and then your actions will have had to have changed, for it to be then visibly evident to people watching you that you have turned away from something. He says, so I marvel that your actions, your beliefs would have changed in such a way that it would be clear that you've turned away from the one who called you in the approval of Messiah to a different good news. See, because Messiah had to approve of you. The Father had to approve of you. And so, again, it's not this unmerited idea. Let's continue to see what's going on in verse 15 by starting in verse 13. He says, For you have heard of my former way of life in, in, uh, in Judaism, in Yehudaism, how intensely I persecuted the assembly of Elohim and ravaged it, and I progressed in Yehudaism beyond many of my age and my race, being more exceedingly ardent for the traditions of my fathers. But it, when it pleased Elohim, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his favor to reveal his son in me, that I might bring him the good news to the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So let's see what's going on here. He's talking about works and how he turned around. But instead of turning away from Messiah, here he's telling you how he turned to Messiah. How in his former life, in the former way of life, he was attacking the believers, the members of the body. This is actions based on beliefs. He said, however, when it pleased Elohim, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his favor. Now, he's not saying that he was called from his mother's womb because of favor. He said, when it pleased Elohim, when, it, when, when Elohim was ready and pleased to do it, he called me by his favor, by his approval that he believed, because he knows the end from the beginning, that if he called me at that moment, I would hear and I would obey and I would go forth in a different way of life. And so he, Elohim, saw and knew what he would do once he called him. So again, well, well was that earned at that point? No. But to see, the thing is, when you read it, it says, when it pleased Elohim, Elohim knew what Paul would do. And so Elohim approved of what was going to happen next once he struck him down on that road and blinded him and then had the blindness taken away from him so that he could truly see and have a relationship with Messiah. He knew what he would do because he knows the end from the beginning. And so it was a timing mechanism of when he would call Shaul to do that. And so this is important that we understand. But again, he called me by his favor by his approval. Was it merited at that point? No, it was actually merited in advance. I hate to say it that way if it makes any sense. But he knew, because it was pleasing to Elohim, he says, when it pleased Elohim, when Elohim felt like this is the moment to do it, he could have done it before. For whatever reason, he allowed Paul, uh, Shaul or Paul to persecute the assembly before doing this. He could have done it before that. So it has to do with the timing of Elohim. When it pleased Elohim... He then, in his approval, in his favor, chose to bring Shaul into the light. And so that was the important point of this message here in chapter 1. Let's continue now in chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 9, and I'm just going to read the one verse here. 
In verse 9, it says, So when Yaakov, Kepha, and Yochanan, who seemed to be supports, came to know the favor that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnaba the right hand of fellowship in order that we go to the Gentiles and they be, to the circumcised. Okay, so here he's saying, and again, I'm not going to get into all the details of the little struggles between him and Yaakov, and Kepha, and Yochanan, but he said that they came to a point where they came to know the approval that had been given to him. In other words, that Abba had approved him to do something. So they didn't come to know the unmerited favor, the unmerited grace, or whatever you want to call it. They came to realize that Paul was actually approved of. And when they realized that he was approved of, they offered him the right hand of fellowship. Now the right hand of fellowship is a, a ritual intended to welcome a new member into the fellowship of a congregation, or welcoming of a new minister into the fellowship of ministry. When we give someone the right hand of fellowship, we are suggesting that we agree to serve Elohim with that person. And so that's what was going on here, in case you're wondering what the right hand of fellowship is. It's not like getting the left foot of fellowship, <laughs> which all of us have experienced. But this is the right hand of fellowship, which actually means that they were agreeing to work together. They were, they were welcoming him in and agreeing to work together. Let's continue now in verse 21 of chapter 2. Now, there's a lot going on in verse 21, and I don't want to get into all of the details of it, but it does say, I do not set aside the favor of Elohim, for if righteousness is through Torah, then Messiah died for nothing. Now, he says, I do not set aside the approval of Elohim. In other words, he said, I'm not going to, for anything, I'm not going to set aside the approval of Elohim. Of Elohim. It's, I can't see how we could again in this verse say it was an unmerited thing. I will not set aside the unmerited whatever that I got from Elohim to do something. You see how it doesn't sort of flow? It doesn't make any sense? He says, I'm not going to set aside the favor that I've merited for anything. Now, this whole thing about righteousness through the Torah, the Messiah died for nothing, let's understand that the book of Galatians, as well as almost all of Paul's writings for that matter, have been messed with to some degree. If you've ever studied a man named Marcion, he's one of the early church fathers, if you could call him that. Okay, hugely anti-Semitic. His whole gospel, not his gospel, his whole canon was part of Luke and most of Paul's letters, even those he edited and made them say what he thought Paul was trying to say. And so if Marcion would do such a thing, anybody would do such a thing. I've got a copy at home of Marcion's canon, and I can read Galatians from that canon and see where verses are missing, verses are edited, and they don't read the same as what you have in your scriptures today. And so we have to understand that there was a lot going on here. What you need to realize is that Paul's main issue was having been a Pharisee of Pharisees was in not putting Talmud equal to Torah. And not putting the oral traditions as if they're Torah. So when he's talking about law, usually the word works of the law should be there. And when he's talking about works of the law, he's talking about the oral law, not the Torah. When he's talking about the written, he'll say the written law, or he'll just say law. So he, there's a lot of things going on in Galatians that we can fix by simply understanding when he's talking about the oral traditions. And so if we fix that right here, just to make a quick aside, he says, look, for if righteousness was through the oral traditions, then Messiah died for nothing. Does that make sense? Okay, and that would, make this, that would fix that verse from the confusion that it looks like somehow it's against the Torah to being of this issue we had with the oral traditions. And so what's happening in Galatia, which he was really upset about, and he was really, this is a very angry letter, is that the Galatians were starting to uh, um, embrace full normative Judaism with all its traditions and all of its stuff equal to Torah. And he didn't understand why they would do that. He was, even though he came from that background, he didn't want to return to that lifestyle. And so you see a lot of that going on here in the book of Galatians. Okay? That's very important that we understand that. But yet, at the same time, he's saying, look, I do not set aside the approval of Elohim to go do, to go do something I shouldn't be doing or don't need to be doing. And so again, I believe we can clearly see that that is merited or approval that is merited. Merited favor, merited approval. Let's go now to chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 4. 
Galatians chapter 5 is going to be in verse 4. But I'm going to read starting in verse 1. I'm going to read and starting in verse 1. In the freedom with which Messiah has made us free, stand, stand firm then and do not again be held with a yoke of slavery. Amen. In the freedom with which Messiah has made us free, stand firm then and do not again be held with the yoke of slavery. Again, he's talking about traditions. Traditions versus Torah. See, I shall say to you that if you become circumcised, Messiah shall be of no use to you. And I witness again to every man being circumcised that he is a debtor to do the entire Torah. You who are declared right by the Torah have severed yourselves from Messiah. You have fallen from favor. Wow, this is some challenging stuff. It's some really challenging stuff. Let's, let's kind of break it down a little bit because we're trying to get to this fallen from favor thing. You've fallen from favor. First of all, I don't see how you could read this verse favor as being unmerited anything. He's trying to say, look, your actions have caused you to no longer merit approval if you're doing these things. So I think clearly, at the very least, before we try to unravel some of this stuff, at the very least, we can see that the word favor or grace here, you've fallen from grace, is talking about approval that was merited that now you've fallen from. That you're no longer going to be in a, in a state of being approved for the things that you have been doing. So let's understand what he's talking about here. And this is going to be very, very challenging because of the things that have been done to this, this letter. He says, I shall, I shall also say to you that if you become circumcised. And what he's talking about here is if you become a, a Jew as, as, as opposed to a believing person who happened to be born Jewish, but a Jew. In other words, someone who's doing all of the things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees do. If you become a Jew, this is his terminology a lot of times is the circumcision versus the uncircumcision. And he's not talking about the actual physical act of circumcision necessarily every time you hear that. He says, look, if you're going to become a Jew, then Messiah shall be of no use to you. In other words, if you're going to think that that's where your salvation lies, that's where your deliverance lies, and that's where everything lies, and just in Judaism, well, then you don't have any use for Messiah. Messiah came to tell the Jewish community, you need more. You need me. Amen. Okay, so if you're not going to do it that way and understand it that way, well, then, of course, Messiah will be of no use to you. He says, I witness again to every man being circumcised. So now if you go ahead and get the physical circumcision done, that you are obligated to do the entire Torah. And that, that is absolutely true, because you wouldn't go ahead and get circumcised until you were ready to obligate yourself to do the exactly. entire Torah. Exactly. And so this debtor is not a good translation there. It's, it's more of an obligation or commitment to. So he says, he says, I'm going to tell you, every man being circumcised is obligated to do the entire Torah. And so you are, you are required to do that. He says, but you who are declared right by the, the um, again, this works of the law should have been in there. You are declared right by the works of the law. Works of the law is his way of phrasing the oral law, the traditions. The works of the law, not works of the law like Sabbath keeping, kashrut eating, feast keeping. When he says works of the law, he's not talking about actually keeping a commandment and doing that work. He's talking about the oral traditions. This is his idiomatic way of saying it. The works of the law. It says if you who are declared right by these works of the law, have severed yourself from Messiah and you've fallen from approval. Again, this is the idea of being declared right. If you think that you're going to be declared right because of these oral traditions, you've, you've missed the whole point. It says you've fallen from approval. For we in spirit by belief eagerly wait for the expectation of righteousness. So he's saying, now he's saying, but we in the spirit by belief, by belief what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and do things that are going to bring the ultimate expectation of what righteousness brings. So in other words, these are people also that believe that the things that they're looking forward to can be brought forth by their actions in their life. But we are expecting with eagerness the blessings that come from obedience that come in the next life. He says, but we, in spirit, by belief, eagerly await for the expectation of righteousness. What righteousness brings but people are saying, hey, if you do these things, it's going to bring all that stuff right now. You don't need to wait on Messiah. You don't need to wait for those things. He says, for in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any strength, but belief working through love. 
In other words, he's saying, look, if there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. It doesn't matter. That's not what gives you strength in being a Jew or being a Gentile. What, has the, what makes the difference is belief working through love. Doing the right works that are through love. What's love connected to? If you love me, keep my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, keep everybody's commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you have to remember, again, when Yeshua was on the earth, what was his continuing problems with the Pharisees and Sadducees? Legal stuff, right? And so that legal stuff a lot of times had to do with his disciples or himself not adhering to a tradition of the, the Jewish elders that they held equal to or above Torah. And so that was the continuous clash going on. So Shaul is saying that I'm, in st I'm standing with Messiah in this. I don't think you need to have this yoke, this burden, this, this, this traditions. Let me tell you something. Not all traditions are bad, but if you're going to think that all the traditions of Talmud are actually law and then try to keep them, good luck. There's a lot of them. There's 39 categories of things you cannot do on Shabbat that you'd have to learn. And then all the permutations that go in the subcategories of those 39 things that you can't do on Shabbat. And that's just one thing, Shabbat. Forget about that there's actually rules about how to put on your shoes. Which foot to put it on first and which one do you lace? And do you put them on first before lacing them or do you, do you put on one and lace it first? I'm not kidding you. There's laws about these things. Okay? And so for you to try to work all of that out and consider it salvific, Consider it what's going to bring what we're, the eagerness of what righteousness is supposed to bring. That we're pursuing this eagerly, awaiting these things, but thinking somehow it's going to bring all that stuff to you right now and right here. Paul's saying, no, that's just not going to happen. He's saying, no, that's just not going to happen. He says, but our belief working through love, he says, that's what's going to do it. He says, you were running well. Who held you back from obeying the truth? So now he's making it clear. He's expecting them to do stuff. He says, you were running well. Now, in Hebraic understanding, or in the Hebrew word itself, the word for doing things down the path is called halakha. That means walking, and now he's using the same idea as to running. You guys were eagerly doing, you were running well. You weren't just walking, you were running in the way. He says, you were running well. Who held you back from obeying the truth? That persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And so now they're going through this thing going, oh, this, this, is, this is now becoming problematic. He goes, that operation has not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens all the lump. I trust in you in the master that you shall have no other mind, and he who is troubling you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Now, as we're going through all of this, what is he talking about? He's talking about the same thing I deal with almost on a weekly basis, people running away from Messiah into Judaism. That's, I think, I really think that's what Shaul is dealing with here with the Galatians. Oh, man. The Galatians got excited about the Torah. The Galatians had no relationship with Messiah. He had already died and been raised. And so the Galatians are only believing what Paul's telling him, telling them about Messiah. And so they're trying to reconcile now their excitement over the Torah and their excitement about Judaism and now excitement about all of the oral traditions that go along with it, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud whichever one, the house of Shammai or the house of Hillel, whichever one they were being shared with, and that he was saying to the Galatians, why are you going and becoming Jews? It's not about becoming Jews. It's about becoming Israel. It's about becoming Torah observant, about submitting yourself to the, the Elohim of Israel, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. But you guys are seeming to want to, you know, I left you for a little while and I come back and look, you're all wanting to be Jews now. You've let go of Messiah. You're focused on the Judaism. You're focused on the, the, the works of the law. And that's the works of the law is not the obedience of Torah. It's the works of the Talmudic understanding. And again, he's not saying that, again, if you wanted to do these traditions, that's the problem. They were, they were embracing it to the point where they were becoming these Orthodox Jewish uh, disciples, basically. They were becoming students of Orthodox Judaism. And hopefully we could see that that's why he's all upset here. He's like, look, I was already there. So just like a reformed smoker or a reformed whatever, you know, you kind of might get angry if someone tries to get you to do it again. So Paul's angry. He's like, look, I, don't, I left all that behind. I've been released from all of that stuff. Not the Torah stuff, but the oral tradition stuff. And the need to, because remember, he had to study all of these things to be a student of Gamaliel. 
He said, I've been released from all of this stuff, and I've not taught you these things. Who is it that's coming in? He's saying here, look, he says, I trust in you, in the master, that you shall have no other mind, and he who is troubling you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Who is it that's trying to get you to become Jews? It's about becoming Israel, not Jews. Who's, and when I say Jews, I don't mean Jew like by the nation of Judah. I'm talking about to become normative or at that time, whatever the, the, the particular sect of Judaism was. You're, you know, Pharisees basically was what it probably was. Who is it that's trying to get you to convert to become pharisaical Jews? He says, Messiah had a problem with the Pharisaism and so do I. Not with the Torah observance. And so we're going forward. He says, look, be careful. A little leaven leavens all up. In other words, he's saying, if you start to head in that direction, you're going to let go of Messiah and everything and become a Pharisee. You're going to become a Pharisee Jew. And we see this problem today the same. I can't tell you. You know, I have a, a friend in the ministry who calls it going over the bridge. And I'll say, oh, there's another one has gone over the bridge. Crossed over the bridge into Judaism. Torah observance is not Judaism. Torah observance was the commandments of Elohim given to all peoples and specifically given to Israel. Yes, amen. He said, these are the commandments that Yahweh gave Israel. The Judaism is what, is, is what the Jewish community who was left in their fears of breaking the commandments, and you can't blame them for this, as they came out of Babylon, added all of these fences upon fences around the law to protect against breaking it. Which actually in itself is not necessarily a bad thing either. But all of a sudden over time, I should say all of a sudden, over time, I guess you can't say all of a sudden over time. Does that make any sense? Over time, it transitioned into the oral law was equal to, if not that, even superior to the actual written Torah. And so this is where the problem actually arises. In the elevation of the oral traditions to be equal to or to actually uh, override or be higher than the actual commands as given at Sinai, the ones that was given through Moshe. And so we have this problem going on here. And he says in verse 11, he says, I, brothers, if I still proclaim circumcision, why am I still persecuted? So now he's admitting he proclaims that they need to circumcise. And so let's understand that Paul never taught against circumcision. He taught about becoming a Jew. He taught against that that wasn't what you needed to do. You didn't need to become filled with embracing this idea called Judaism. Torah observance, by the way, is not Judaism. It's a part of, Juda of Judaism. Torah observance is what was given to Israel and was supposed to be for the whole world. Let's continue. He says, if I still proclaim circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the stake has been set aside. Oh, that those who disturb you would even cut themselves off. So he knows there are people that are bothering them and disturbing them to try to get them to become, become Pharisees, essentially. For you brothers have been called to freedom. Only do not use freedom as an occasion for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Okay, so now he's going to give you the works part of this. He says, do not use freedom as, a, as an occasion for the flesh. What freedom is he talking about? Well, what did Yaakov tell us? Yaakov told us in, in Yaakov chapter 1, he says, if, he says, if you look into, verse 25 of chapter 1, he says, but he who looked into the perfect Torah, that of freedom. So he's saying, look, I gave you the Torah. Paul's saying, I gave you the Torah. It is freedom. But the Jewish community in their fears, and you can't blame them for that, so many terrible things that happened because they broke the commandments, that they decided in their fear and paranoia to protect it in a, in a, in a very extreme way, he says, but look, he says, you have freedom. You've been called to freedom, freedom to, to, to observe the commandments, freedom from all the paganism, freedom from all the traditions, freedom from all of the nonsense. By the way, so have you. Because all of that Christianity stuff was filled with its own version of Talmud, Christmas and Easter and all these other rituals and things that you had to go doing. This is their own traditions. And so you have all of that burden. And so as you go through that, he's saying, look, you're now free. Free to keep what the Almighty set in place. The law is from on high. He says, but do not use freedom as an occasion for the flesh. Now let me, he's, Paul's now saying, now let me tell you what I'm talking about. He goes in verse 14, he says, for the entire Torah is completed in one word. 
in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the goal of the Torah is to teach you how to love one another. It doesn't mean that if you love one another, that does away with the Torah. Because that's this whole idea of completed that you hear in Christianity, that somehow if something's completed, it's done away with. Realize that when Yeshua said, I did not come to destroy, but to complete or fulfill, then if you're going to use that same interpretation for doing away with Torah, then you have to have no joy anymore either. Because Yeshua said, I came so that your joy would be filled too. So he, obviously he did away with joy. Well, you've got to use equal weights and equal measures here. Clearly he didn't do away with joy. Clearly he didn't do away with the Torah. And that's not what the phrase is talking about. But he says, look, the entire Torah is fulfilled or completed. In other words, you can accomplish what the Torah is trying to accomplish in loving your neighbor as yourself. That's right. He says, and if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. In other words, you're going to bite each other, you're going to consume each other. And I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. Amen. Walk in the spirit and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. Now, Christianity wants to turn this into some sort of ooey gooey ethereal walking in the spirit thing and being led by whatever voice you think you're hearing in your head. No, walk by the spirit goes back to John 14 when Yeshua says, I am the truth. And then he says, I will send you the spirit of truth. And he says, I am that spirit of truth. I will not leave you orphans. I'm coming to you. And that's one of the things where people get really confused about in John 14. Let's just turn there for a second. Hold your place here in Galatians. Because I want to make sure we finish Galatians today. But in John 14, he says, he says in verse 6, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then if you drop down, he says... If you love me, verse 15, if you love me, you shall guard my commands. Now, if you love me and guard my commands, I shall ask the Father. So there's a, there's a predicate here. This is predicated on if you love me and guard my commands, then I'll ask the Father. This isn't predicated on if you make an altar call, I'm going to ask the Father, and all of a sudden you're going to have the Spirit in you. No. If you love me and guard my commands, then I will ask the Father to do something for you. That sounds like merited favor. That sounds like merited approval. If you do, and, I, and it merits my approval, I will ask the Father, whatever, excuse me, if you ask whatever in my name, excuse me, I, I skipped back to verse 14, if, and I shall ask the Father, and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. So he's going to give you a helper to stay with you forever. And I don't know how another really works in there in the Greek. But I'm gonna, he's going to send you a helper to help you. Who is this helper? Let's read verse 17 really clearly. This helper is the spirit of truth. I don't know. What did we just define truth as? Yeshua said, I am the truth. So this is the spirit of Yeshua. Now listen to this carefully. It's very clear if you go slowly. Whom the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him right now. You know him now because he stays with you right now and shall be in you. Amen. Now the words right now, we're not in there, but that's what it's saying. So who could he be talking about that they knew and was with them and shall be in them? It could only be himself. And in case that's ambiguous, read the next verse. I shall not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. So this is not a third entity. This is not some third being of the Trinity. Yeshua is talking about himself, but he's trying to talk to a bunch of people that he's been training for a, a, quite a bit here, a couple years, right? He's been training them, discipling them. He's told them over and over, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. When I get there, they're going to take me. They're going to scourge me. They're going to do all kinds of horrible things to me. They're going to kill me. And then I'm going to be resurrected. And they weren't getting it. Now, this is right before that's happening. This is very close to when he's about to finally die. And he's trying to communicate to them and say, look, I'm going someplace you can't go. I'm not going to be here forever, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I will come to you through this thing called the Ruach HaKodesh, by the, the means by which it's the way I will be connected to you. I am the spirit of truth. So let's understand that spirit of truth. Now we go back to Shaul and what he's talking about in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, see again, this whole Trinitarian thing, people go, oh, but the spirit is the helper. I don't see how you get anything out of it that's not Yeshua. He says, look, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him and he stays with you. I mean, who else could he be talking about but himself? 
And then he goes, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. Actually, verse 19, he says, yet a little while the world no longer sees me, but you shall see me because I live and you shall live. And in that day you shall know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. So is this talking about a third separate thing? Absolutely not. Now there is a third element in there that's going to make this possible called the Spirit, called the Ruach HaKodesh, because you don't feel Yeshua walking around inside you, do you? But there's this thing called the Ruach that flows from the Father, that flows from the Elohim, that allows for and makes it possible for Yeshua to live in you. Do we understand that? Of course we don't understand that. That's like amoebas trying to figure out a human being. It's way above our heads. But we know that it's true, and we accept that it's true. So back in Galatians, back in Galatians he said, look, if in verse 18, he said, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the, under the Torah. Now, if you are led by the Spirit, so what Spirit are we talking about? Yeshua, the Spirit of Truth. So if you're led by the Spirit of Truth, now how can you be led by the Spirit of Truth if you're not, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So you must be keeping the commandments to be led by the Spirit. Because if you're not, you're not being, you're, well, you may be being led by a Spirit, but it's the wrong Spirit. If you're being led by the Spirit, with a big capital S, not that there's capitals in Greek, but it's, if you're being led by the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, well then you're keeping His commandments. He says, and you are not under the Torah. In other words, then you are not under the penalty of the Torah because if you're keeping the commandments, there is no penalty that you'd be suffering. He says, and the works of the flesh are well known. And so he's now comparing the works of the flesh with the works of the Spirit. He says, excuse me, in verse 16, he says, I say, walk in the Spirit and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. I guess I jumped over to 18, but if you go back to 16, he says, walk in the Spirit and you will not accomplish the lust of the flesh. Why? Because if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll give you the Spirit. And if you're keeping the commandments, if you're loving him, and you have the Spirit, you're not going to do fleshly things. You're going to do Elohim things. And so you won't be walking in the flesh, because the Spirit will lead you into all truth. We know the truth is not only in John 14, 6, Yeshua, but we know in Psalm 119, 142, and in verse 160, that the Word is truth, and the Torah is truth, the commandments are truth. And that Yeshua put on flesh in John 1.14, the Word put on flesh. And so he's saying here, look, if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're walking in truth, if you're walking in the commandments, you, cannot, you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh, because the commandments teach you how to not do that. He says, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. There's not in man to know which way to even put his feet. The way that seems right to a man leads to death. The flesh has no idea what to do that is right. It has to be from the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Messiah, the Spirit of Torah. He says, and these are opposed to each other, so that you do not do what you desire to do. So you desire to keep the commandments, but your flesh doesn't want to do it. You desire to keep the commandments, but your flesh has other things it'd like to do that goes against the commandments. And so there's your temptations. If you didn't have flesh, you'd have no temptations. But your flesh says, I don't like, I don't want. Oh, but that's not fair. But I like that other thing. Why can't I have that? Why can't I do that? That's what the flesh sounds like. And the spirit says, no, that's not safe. That doesn't bless. That's not loving me. That's not loving the, fa the, 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 uh, the neighbor as yourself. That's not loving. That's self-centered, selfish, self-possessed, self-consumed, uh, self-satisfying. And so we're, we're comparing spirit versus self here. And so now he says, he says, and so these things are at odds. These things are at war with each other. These things are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you desire to do. And doesn't Shaul at some point say, that which I desire to do, I don't do, and that which I don't desire to do, I do? Why? Because he's still in flesh. Yes. All of us have that problem, which is why we need to repent daily. All of us have a problem with flesh. If you didn't, you would have no struggle and never need to repent. You wouldn't have to deal with all the things that you have to deal with. But you know why you have flesh problems? Because you still have humility problems. Because it's the I, 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 me, 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 I don't like, I don't want, I don't think. That's not fair. Why is that happening to me? But, but, but. That's all that stuff that's about you. 
And so the humility comes into place, you'll stop doing all of that stuff. And so now in that context, he says, but if you were led, if you are led by the Spirit, by the truth, by the Torah, you're not under the Torah, you're not under the law. He says, because there's no penalty for that. Because the penalties only come when you break it. But if you were actually keeping it, there wouldn't be any penalty to worry about. There'd only be blessings. He says, and the works of the flesh are well known. Now he's going to compare the two. And the works of the flesh are well known. Which are these? Adultery, whorings, uncleanness, indecency, idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, quarrels, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and factions, envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like, of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, that those who practice such as these shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Amen. But who inherits the kingdom of Elohim? The righteous inherit the kingdom of Elohim. But also, what does it say? In, in, in Messiah said this. He said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit things. Because if you're meek, you're not about you. There's a selflessness in being meek. Continuing, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit of what? Of Yeshua, of truth, of Torah, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no Torah. In other words, if you're doing these things, you're not breaking anything. He said, and those who are of Messiah have impaled the flesh with its passions and desires. That's what should be nailed to the stake. Yes. Not the law. He says, you need to be impaling and dying to self all those fleshly passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, the spirit of what? Of truth, of Yeshua, of Torah, let us also walk in it. Amen. Let us walk in the spirit. And again, Christianity has turned us into a totally ethereal, non-able-to-be-grasped sort of whatever you want to make it up to be is fine with me. Because they don't have anything that they can nail this down to. It's completely subject to anybody's opinion. And there's plenty of them out there. And it's the excuse for why everybody does what they do. He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So hopefully that's making a whole lot more sense about what's going on in Galatians chapter 5. So he's, he's certainly not coming against the Torah. He's trying to say, look, if you're walking in it, you wouldn't have any need to worry about being under the law. And we're talking about under, it means the penalty that you would receive. There's no penalties to worry about if you're keeping it all. And there's freedom if you're keeping it all. Amen. And I know many of you have told me about how unshackled your life has become and unburdened your life has become since you started realizing what you're expected to do and what, you're, that, what is not expected of you. The freedom in that. And yet, disgustingly, despicably, there are teachers out there who I won't name at this moment, although I'm tempted, who are actually bashing that freedom of Torah observance and limiting what they're going to do to just maybe the Ten Commandments yeah. because they now want to say that all of the rest of it is now burden. It wasn't enough that they let go of the Talmudic stuff. Now they're saying that there's more to let go of because even though when I knew them before, and these are teachers that I know, when I knew them before, they never said any such thing about any observance being a burden. Yeah. They were glad to wear the tzitzit. They were glad to eat properly. They were glad to do all of these things that they're now saying, oh, we don't have to do any of that anymore. That was an awful burden that we suffered with all these years. Yeah. They're lying to everybody. Because I know from their own mouths that they never felt that way before. But because it justifies their position, they're claiming, oh, I never liked having to do all that stuff, and I never liked this, and I never felt free. Nonsense. They spoke completely the opposite in their days. And so for them to be saying that stuff now is ridiculous. But they're using it as an excuse to go ahead and get rid of stuff. And that's, they're not walking in the spirit. They're walking in the wrong spirit. What is the wrong spirit? The spirit of anti-Mashiach, which is the spirit of lawlessness, Torahlessness. 
You want to know who the anti-Messiah is? Well, you want to know there are a million of them out there. You know, not, we're not talking about the anti-Messiah, but all those people that are against Messiah, they're against it. Messiah, they prove it when they're against the law. He is the law. He gave the law. He's the embodiment of the law. Okay? He is the walking, talking law. He says, imitate me. Well, how can you imitate him? Well, you do what he did. What did he do? He kept the law perfectly. But yet people are out there in this lawless spirit. He says, if we live in the spirit of what? The spirit of truth, the spirit of the law, the spirit of Torah, the spirit of Yeshua, let us also walk in that spirit, walk in that law, walk in Yeshua. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, this provoking and envying thing has to do with people saying, oh, well, yeah, you guys are just Gentiles. Don't you want to be like us over here? In this Judaism thing, where we have all this power structure and all these years of, of, of history and culture and see all that tempting and luring and provoking that's going on? The provoking one another, the envying one another. I've spoken to many people who've said to me, oh, I, I, I'm so jealous of what the Jews have. And I understand that because they have a community. They have a culture they have a certain amount of unity and bonding that can't be broken because no matter what, they have the bonding of being Jewish. Stop envying it and build it here. There's an idea for you. Stop envying it and build it here in the context of Messiah. Yes. Oh, no, but then I, then I have to actually love my brother and tolerate the things that offend me, and I'd have to... Yes, you would. That's right. Yes, you would. That's what Shaul is saying right here. Cut out all that nonsense and realize your family. Oh, but I don't agree with it. I don't like it. Stop all that I stuff. Ay, 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 oy, oy, oy. Cut that out. It's not about you. It's about him. And he wants you to make it about him and about neighbors and about love and about community. That's why we get together a couple of times a year for these community functions called feasts. So we can learn how to live as community. And we can develop those talents and those skills. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to finish the book of Galatians here and also wrap up the teaching for today with Galatians. And then we'll continue with Ephesians next week in part 12. But this is part 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 18. It's the last verse. And as often is the case in these letters, they start off with and they also end with a salutation of something like this, which says, The favor of our Master Yeshua Messiah be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. He says, The favor of our Master Yeshua. What's the favor that he's talking about there? The undeserved, unmerited favor? Why, how does that make any sense? He's saying, The approval of our Master Yeshua Messiah be with your spirit. What spirit? The spirit he just finished talking about all the time in chapter 5. The spirit that you need to be walking in. The one that brings approval. The one that brings merited favor. The one to put you in good standing with the creator of the universe. That favor of our master Yeshua, Messiah, be with your spirit, brothers. Amen and amen. That's what he's talking about there. That's what he's talking about. And so this is really important that we understand. You know, this is important. Even go back to verse 15, it says, For in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any strength but a renewed creature. In other words, it says, it's not about what you were born. Stop worrying about being a Gentile or a Jew. And again, he's not talking about the physical act of circumcision here. He's saying it's not about being a Jew or a Gentile. We are one in Messiah. We are a renewed creature. It's called an Israelite, the Israel of Yahweh, not the Israel created by man. The Israel of Yahweh. Remember, it's Yahweh that changed Yaakov's name to Yisrael. It's the Yisrael of Yahweh. He says, look, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace and compassion be upon you. So he says, as many as are doing what? Walking a certain way. If you're walking this way, I wish a certain blessing upon you. I wish peace to be upon you, compassion to be upon you. He says, and upon all the Yisrael of Elohim. Ah, there it is. That's who he's talking about, the Yisrael of Elohim. And to those, he says, from now on, let no one trouble you, for I bear in my body the scars of the Master Yeshua. He says, the favor of the Master, the approval of the Master Yeshua, Messiah, be with your spirit, brothers. Do you see the context? Can you, can you, is there any other way to see this than merited approval? 
I can't, I just can't see how that happens. Yet all of us, including me, I'm certainly not outside of this category, until this teaching, which includes me, until I started studying this out to do this teaching, and before it was revealed to me, all of us thought that grace was unmerited favor. We all could have spewed that out very easily. Hey, what's grace mean? Unmerited favor. Every one of us could have just said that out without even thinking a thought. It just automatically would have came out of our mouth. Yet we've now gone through all the Tanakh, all the Gospels, all the writings of John, James, and Peter. All we have left is Paul's writings. And still, even in Paul's writings, have we seen any hint of unmerited favor? Not a single hint of unmerited favor. And so that's the beauty of the, the scriptures is that when you go through the word, if you are understanding it correctly, if you're really studying it out, you should see that everything is fitly knit, knit together. Like the verses when we're going to see in Ephesians where we're a body that is knit, fitly you know, knit together. The verses should fit together nicely, word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept. We should not see a totally discombobulated, different way of seeing something in the Brick Hadashah versus in the Tanakh. Yes. It should be exactly the same thing everywhere. Yes. And so here we see, hopefully in Galatians, that it is exactly the same thing. It is consistent. Now, we did cover some of the issues in Galatians. We need to cover a lot more. Even though I said we wouldn't, we did it anyway. Because it just, it's important that we cover some of that. But let's understand that now that we've gone through 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we've gone through Galatians, we're seeing that there's no inconsistencies. The favor that's being talked about, the grace that's being talked about is merited by our actions. It's approval or good standing in the eyes of the Almighty when we do what brings approval and good standing in the eyes of the Almighty. And what brings that? Doing what's right in His eyes. Doing what he says to do and not doing your stuff. And I like the way that Paul's talking about it, if we understand it correctly, by being led by the Spirit. But being led by the Spirit is not an ooey-gooey that, you know, I felt like the Spirit led me to stay in this Sunday church and not come to Saturday. And not. No, the Spirit did no such thing. But I've heard that. Have you ever heard that from somebody? Well, the Spirit has me in this Sunday church. Hmm, okay, yes, a Spirit has you in that Sunday church. Not the Spirit, but a Spirit. Amen. The Spirit would not have you in that Sunday church under any circumstance. Except as a guest speaker to try to share with them to get them out. But you would not be attending. Okay? The Spirit would not have you doing whatever it is that goes against the commandments. Because the Spirit is the Spirit of the commandments. The Spirit of Yeshua, the Spirit of the law, the Spirit of the Torah. The Spirit of truth. We need to embrace that. Let's go before the Father. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King. Father, we come before you. And Father, we are just humbled by your word. We are just awed by the, the, just the, the information that you are, are just giving us about life and how things work and our relationships with you and with each other. And Father, we thank you for giving us this owner's manual and, and how to, this operation manual for, for us as human beings. You know, we as human beings are so used to everything coming with some sort of a an owner's manual to tell us how to operate it and how to work it, and yet most people are walking through life not knowing at all, not having a clue as to what to do, what's right and what's wrong. And here you've given us the blueprint. You've given us the instructions we need to have true joy and peace and love and, and understanding and wisdom and discernment and knowledge and all the things that we need to function in this world. And so, Father, we pray and ask in Yeshua's name and his authority that you would bless us with the spirit to lead us. The ruach of truth, the ruach of, of your commandments, the ruach of, of Yeshua. That you would bless us with the spirit to lead us and that you would give us a heart to sublimate, uh, to sublimate our desires, to humble ourselves so that we can be led and submit to the spirit. And that we would not be self-seeking and seeking after our own passions and desires, but we can impale them rather instead and to embrace and to walk in the Spirit. Because if we are to live in the Spirit, we know we need to walk in the Spirit. So Father, we come to you just humbled by this knowledge and understanding for your revealing of truth and for unraveling the lies that we've embraced for so many years that we want to thank you. We want to pause and just... Thank you for your mercy and your compassion to finally open up our eyes to share with us this understanding so that we can walk in it. 
Father, may we do what brings approval in your eyes. May we do what's right in your eyes so that you may look down on us and approve and that we may be in good standing with you so that you'll desire to bless us and you'll desire to say the words, well done, you good and trustworthy servant. Enter into the reign, into the kingdom, into the rest of your king. So Father, thank you. Thank you so much for all these things as we come to you and thank you in the name of Yeshua. In his name and authority, we come before you and thank you. It's by his power that we have any of this and we appreciate that. So Father, thank you in his name. Amen. Amen.